great to be with you again today. I'm so glad that you've tuned in, and I, I promise you I'm committed to make this worthwhile your next 30 minutes. We're talking about the gospel revolution. God made you sufficient, and, and yesterday I didn't even get to that point about God made you sufficient. I will today, however. Uh, but again, I draw your attention to the overall theme, the gospel revolution. We know if you stay abreast of what's happening in the church world, there is decline. Church attendance is in decline in every country in the Western world. And, and in, in Canada, what's helping us is immigrants coming in, immigrants coming in. God bless the immigrants because many of them have a, a Christian faith and so they, they join churches. But I submit all kinds of people think they have the answer. They can tell you why there's decline and why, why this and why that. I submit we have forgotten the gospel. We think we know the gospel because what, what is more sounding fundamental and, and, and kind of the early stages of your Christian journey than to hear the gospel. But I submit we, 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 we replaced it with tradition. And I want to bring it back. And so stay tuned with us today. It's going to be good. Remember as well that all the information on the screen there, we want to hear from you. You can text me. You can call the Grace Prayer Center. And you can go online. I think I covered it all. And, um, and, and also I am offering our book package, Saturate Yourself with the Gospel. It's not the teaching I'm giving here this week, but everything I write and speak and do is built on the foundation of that what Christ has done is enough. And yesterday we talked about how the gospel is good news. Seems like that phrase wouldn't need any explanation, wouldn't need any teaching, but people have lost sight of this very basic, that it's good. If you're not saying something that's good, it's not gospel. The, the essence of the gospel is good. Second part, it's, it's news. News is not a forecast, I'm hoping God is going to do this, or God is about to do that. News is something that has already happened. Now, I'm not going to reteach what I taught yesterday, but just to say another way to say gospel is to say new covenant or better covenant. And, and much of the New Testament, or the last 27 books of the Bible, it paints a picture of a contrast between what we call systemic religion, because it, it, it was a system of religion, a system of principles and procedures by which people would gain in their mind and to their thinking, they would gain access and favor from God. And, and that system, and it could be the Jewish religion, it could be the Christian religion, it could be any religion, it could become a systemic religion of rules and principles where people kind of climb a ladder to gain more access to God. That is in contrast to the gospel or to the new covenant. So, so here we're going to get to that phrase that you see behind me about sufficient. Uh, I'm going to read from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, let me start with verse 4 there. Such confidence we have uh, through Christ toward God. Toward God. Uh, let, let me pause that. Paul's saying, we, I, I'm, I'm very confident. I, I have confidence uh, uh, towards God. I'm not afraid of God. I'm not cowering. I am confident towards God. So when I think of God, I don't think like running to hide and, 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 and you know, I, I better put my best foot forward. I want to try to, you, you know, impress God so that God will favor me. No, I, I'm, I'm confident. And, and so what is the basis for that? Because some would think that that's almost belligerent. You know, Paul, you should come to God cowering in fear. But Paul says that's not the modus operandi of the gospel. That's not what the gospel revolution does to you. It makes you have confidence. And he says, it's through Christ. It's through what Christ has done. And then he says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves. So, so, so let's pause there for a moment. He uses the word sufficient. He says, we are not somehow sufficient in ourselves. It's not the thinking that 
We have followed the procedures. We have followed the rules of our religion. We, we've done everything right. So now we kinda, we're, we're kind of confident. We, 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 can, we, you know, we, we did everything that we should do. He says, no, our, our sufficiency is not of ourselves. We are not sufficient. We, we don't think that anything is from ourselves. So, so when Paul saw a, a healing happen, as I've seen thousands of times, Paul says, and I think the same way. I don't think, oh, it's because I prayed so much. It's because I'm so holy. It's because of, no, no, I don't think like that. Even the great Simon Peter in the book of Acts chapter 3, you know, when, when the lame man who had been lame for 40 years was raised up and he was walking and leaping and dancing, the people would say, oh, Simon Peter, you're so holy. You have special power. And, and, and Simon Peter vigorously refuted that. He says, no, no, it's not our power. It's not our holiness that made this man to walk. It's the faith that works through Jesus Christ. It's this, this is the gospel idea. We don't think of anything as being from ourselves. I don't think that, you know, God did this and he blessed this group of people and, 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 and God did such and such because I had really uh, dotted all my I's and crossed my T's. I had done everything so that God, no, no. We, we don't think that anything is from ourselves. But then he says, but our sufficiency is from God. <laughs> I love that word sufficiency. You know what that means, sufficiency? I'm sufficient. Another Bible translation calls it adequate. It means I, I have what I need. So if you're sufficient, I would say to you, uh, do you need something? He said, no, 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 I don't, I don't need, I, I'm fine, thank you. I have everything I need. Paul says, our sufficiency is from God. This is contrary to all religious thinking. Religious thinking, it should be like, oh, I'm not what I should be. I don't have what I, oh, oh, woe me. This kind of negative, tear-jerking religious Christianity, it's not found in the gospel. It's not found in the new covenant. Paul says our sufficiency is not of ourselves. It's from God. God has given us sufficiency. We have everything we need because we have God. And then he says, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Hold it right there. God made us sufficient. You say, why is that? Well, I can say for one reason, you wouldn't make yourself sufficient. If I was to ask you and I say, are you sufficient? You would probably give me reasons. No, 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 no. You know, there's some things going, oh, I'm facing some struggles. I, oh, oh, oh. You, you, you would give me lots of reasons why you are not sufficient. You don't have what it takes. You're not adequate. So here it says, God didn't consult you. He said he made us sufficient. God made you adequate. How? How? as ministers of the new covenant. So here is the key. The gospel covenant, the better covenant, the new covenant, that's how we are sufficient. This is in contrast to all religion, all the religions of the whole world. Let me finish it, and then I'll expound on that. It says, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And I'm going to comment on that. I may not even get to that today. But the previous point there, that every religion tells you you're insufficient. Sad to say, and I'm speaking primarily of the evangelical, charismatic branch of the Christian faith, which with I'm most familiar, though I work with Catholic friends and Protestant friends and mainline Protestants. I work with Lutherans. I work with all kinds of people around the world. But if I just focus on maybe the part of the church where I'm the most familiar, it's a parade of insufficiency. We, we constantly talk about what we don't have, and we need this, and we need that, and we need the power of God, and we need revival, and we need, we need. You don't find this kind of expression anywhere in the New Testament record. Paul never says to the Ephesians, you need the power of God. Oh, you need to be blessed. You need more anointing. He never says that, not once, not once, and he tells them a lot of things. John never says it, not once, not Simon Peter. None of them say that. So what do they say? They say, you have it. John says, you have an anointing from a holy one. 
Paul says, all things are yours. Everything you, Peter says, everything that you need for, for life and godliness, you have it in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, so sufficient. You, you think about that word. Say it to yourself. Say, God made me sufficient. Well, let that word not just be read, and then we go on to the next verse, but let it roll around in there. Just like you had one of those, you know, I used to, when I was a kid, my dad would take me to the candy store, not very often, but on rare occasions, and I, and I would get to pick a few little candies. I always like to pick one of those hard ones, because I would, I, I could almost look at, look at the time, how long could I keep it in my mouth while I was kind of feeling the flavor of that candy as it was slowly <laughs> disappearing in my mouth. And if I could keep it going for a whole hour, it probably ruined my teeth, but it felt good on the taste buds. Well, let that word, God made me sufficient through the new covenant, the gospel covenant, the better covenant. Let it just sit there like a hard candy and you, you, you slowly let that dissolve and think about it. You say, well, I, I never thought of myself that way. And some might say, well, I protest. I'm not sufficient. Well, I don't feel like I have that. Well, you see, I'm not teaching the gospel to, to tell you everything you feel. I, I'm teaching what God says about you, that you might be lifted up to see yourself as God sees you. That's awesome. Well, in a moment, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a little report from one of our many campaigns. In fact, I think, let, let's go to that right now, then I'll pick up from there, because I have a whole, some very, very, very poignant statements to make. So let's look at that report first, and then I'll be back. The Bible gives a clear record. God gives His people victory in adverse circumstances. During World Impact Ministries' gospel campaign in Nagpur, India, with just two days to go before the opening service, everything looked hopeless. Newspaper headlines declared that militant groups demanded that the event be canceled. Other articles warned against the prayer for the sick that would occur. Still others suggested that Peter Youngren had come for the purpose of mass conversion, which is a crime in India. Yes, World Impact Ministries faced adverse, impossible circumstances. Have you ever faced such a circumstance? Maybe you are facing one right now. As the tension mounted, the police issued an order where Peter Youngren was not allowed to speak or pray in the name of Jesus. Peter commented, without the name of Jesus, there is no gospel campaign. We must freely speak in the name of Jesus. After 24 hour negotiation between Christian leaders and the police, the pastors were handed a long list of restrictions against Peter Youngren. While they were on the way from the office of the police, suddenly there was another phone call again, asking them to return to the police station. Once there, the local pastors discovered that the police had had a change of heart. The ban against Peter Youngren's prayer and preaching in the name of Jesus were lifted. Inexplicably, the freedom to preach Christ had been restored, God's favor. Get ready for God's favor in your circumstances. The battle continued, this time from militant anti-Christian groups who filed a court injunction to stop Peter Youngren's preaching, saying that it would lead to mass conversion. After lengthy discussions and with just one hour to go before the opening service, the judge dismissed the case. The night of the gospel festival became a resounding victory. Newspapers reported massive attendance and that more than 10 deaf people on the first night alone had been healed, as well as cancer cases and people who have come out of a coma, citing names and specific cases. Still, the battle wasn't over. Militant anti-Christian groups filed another court injunction, this time charging Peter Youngren with practicing medicine without a license. Again, this accusation fell to the ground as the campaign continued to proclaim Jesus Christ, God's favor. Have you ever faced a battle with ups and downs? Remember, God gives you victory. Militants had promised to violently attack the campaign. Seeing the miracles that God did, they held back and there was no violent interruption at all. God's favor. Instead of defeat, there was a week of uninterrupted manifestation of God's love. Local believers were rejoicing. Just a week earlier, everything had looked hopeless. And now, victory. 
And not only that, one of the politicians from the political party that is associated with anti-Christian activities was himself healed. The joy never seemed to want to end as he and his son stood on the platform to testify how Jesus Christ had removed the tumors across his stomach and his chest. Once again, God's favor. Remember that Paul wrote that in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. No matter what you are facing, God is for you now. When you partner with World Impact Ministries, you partake of the same grace for victory in adverse circumstances. That's right. God's word says that you are a partaker of the same grace. Expect the same blessing and miracles that God gives in gospel campaigns around the world to be also in your home. Thank you for your partnership. To become a partner today, please call 1-877-974-7223 or give at www.peteryoungren.org. Your participation is crucially important. Thank you. Please call now 1-877-974-7223. Well, as you can see, these campaigns do not go unnoticed. Of course, it's hard to gather that many people because, and the reason they come is because when we preach this gospel and then God confirms the validity, the reality, the substance of our message by doing wonders among the people, then, then thousands and tens of thousands more are added every night until the crowd just overflows the stadiums and the open fields that we use. And so sometimes that means we, we butt up against political and religious uh, powers that want to stop us, not unlike what you read in the Gospels. And so in, in that particular case there where I was taken to court twice, uh, I, I, it, it, it was like really the cherry on the ice cream sundae, you know, after we've been acquitted. And then one of the politicians, you saw him there, uh, from the very political party that was leading this opposition, I don't want to say, say persecution, it, I guess it was a form of persecution, but opposition, one of those politicians uh, was brought there by his son, also in that political party, and, and with tumors across his chest, and God healed him. It was like, like you, you know, we, we talked about God's love, but it was like God really showed his love. And so thank you. You saw there on the screen, and you come up and see it right now, how you can participate with us and partner with us in the gospel. In fact, let, let me, before I go on teaching, let's, let's do it right now. Uh, if you can help us either with a, with a one-time gift or if you can help us by becoming a part of the VIP team that gives something every month. You see that on the screen, how you can participate and, and jot that information down. You probably want to hear my next about 10 minutes left of teaching, but jot that down and, and then get online or call the number and say, I want to participate in this. What, what we are talking about today, and I, let me say thank you for doing that. Thank you. I'll give you a brief reminder at the end. We're talking about a, a gospel revolution, and, and the theme this week is God made you sufficient, and we already covered that. But we, we draw a contrast here. It says that He did it by the New Covenant. God made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, in contrast to the old systemic religion. Let me just illustrate this. Make some distinction. When I say, you may wonder, what are you talking about when you talk about systemic religion? Well, it could be the old covenant, uh, the Judaism, but it could also be a systemic religion of traditions within Christianity or within any other religion. And that stands in contrast to the gospel. So here's one little statement. Ponder this. Under systemic religion, the old covenant, people were burdened with continual reminders of sins. While now in the new covenant, we understand that God remembers our sins no more. Uh, let, let me read that again real quickly. Under systemic religion, the old covenant thinking people were burdened with continual reminders of sins. Think about that. They could never forget it. Their conscience was always filled with a sin mentality. 
and they had to receive a, an allowance, if you wish, of cleansing from sin. While in the gospel covenant, God remembers our sins no more. That, that's something to think about. Uh, you, we can look at the Jewish religion. You know, uh, the, they, they uh, once a year, the high priest in the temple would go into the Holy of Holies and on the Day of Atonement to cover the people's sins. And then they had to wait for the next year. So they got, a, they got an annual installment of forgiveness of sin. Now imagine yourself. What if you're a Jewish man and, 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 and you know, you're happy to go to Jerusalem for the Day of Atonement? And, and you have all kinds of sins, and you know, I failed this past year, but now I'm going to go and get relief for my sins. So you go to the temple, and you're there, and the high priest comes out, and he says, the sacrifice is accepted, and then this man, he's going to head home. Maybe he lived, let us say, for, for, for the story's sake, he lived somewhere in northern Galilee, and so he has a little journey back. And on the journey back, he gets a little sidetracked, Maybe he, 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 he stops at a bar and drinks a little too much he shouldn't drink, and by the time he gets home, he's a little bit of a hangover. And, 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 and then his wife says, where have you been? And he swears at her, and boy, the whole thing is lost. I don't recommend that behavior, but I'm saying, here's a guy now. He's just left the temple, and all his sins are forgiven. And, and in two or three days, he's back home, and he has to wait another year, another year, before he can have his sins forgiven again. He has the way to live with that guilt. So you see how, how there was just a temporary relief. It was like their sins were always before them. Now, my dear Catholic friends, they have a lot of good beliefs in my Roman Catholic friends. Uh, they, they believe in the power of the blood of Jesus, but, but some of you maybe have the same problem. You have to go to Mass, take the Eucharist, and you get another, another week or another few days of sin relief. What about my Protestant friends? In the Protestant Christian faith, they don't put as much emphasis on the Eucharist or the communion. So, so it's more like every time I, I, I got to remind myself to ask God to forgive me. I got to ask God all the time. So whenever I'm reminded, but in between, I kind of have to just put up with it. See, that is not the gospel. We need a gospel revolution. The gospel revolution is that God remembers your sin no more. He remembers them no more. He doesn't remember them, so he doesn't want you to remember either. You walk free from that. Now, I know people get super nervous when I say that. People get so nervous, they don't know which way to look. They say, well, if, if, if you say like that, that Jesus put away all sins, uh, past, present, and future, well, it's not that I say it. It's very clear. Read the book of Hebrews. By one sacrifice, he put away our sins forever. But they say, well, but you, 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 you can't tell people that because people are going to abuse that. No, they're not going to abuse it, my friend. They're going to be so filled with love for the one who has loved them so much that you don't want to sin. That's what Romans six fourteen says, that sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Well, how, 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 how is that going to happen? That sin no longer has dominion because you're not under the law. You're not under that continual reminder of sins, but you're under God's grace where God remembers your sins no more. Let me give you another distinction here. Under systemic religion, the old covenant, the Holy Spirit came on people temporarily. Well, now in the new covenant, the gospel covenant, we know that the Holy Spirit is with us forever. And I give you a reference there, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, if you want to study that more. This was the idea that from time to time, at some special time, possibly a prayer or special urgent need, under the systemic religion of the old covenant, the Holy Spirit would come upon some person and then leave. And you see many beautiful Christians, they're still living under that deceptive thinking that, that they say, Holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit. While Jesus so clearly says, I will send you another helper, the Holy Spirit, and he will be with you always, always. You say, well, what, what if I fail? 
What if I mess up? Well, the Holy Spirit, what kind of friend would the Holy Spirit be if he would just leave you, leave you to your devices? No, no. You see, the, the new covenant, the gospel covenant is so much better. I, I, I just got a couple of minutes. I ran out of time. This is what happens all the time. We just run out of time of this good teaching. But I want to remind you and I want to pray with you that the Holy Spirit is with you right now. The Holy Spirit is there where you are, reminding you of Jesus Christ. And, and before I pray with you, I remind you that these books, get the whole book package, get the whole package saturate yourself with gospel thinking. So much preaching and teaching is not founded upon the new covenant, the better covenant of the gospel. Everything I write, even though I'm addressing all kinds of topics in these books here, faith, one of them is about God's plan for our finances, one is about reaching Muslims, one is this fantastic book that everybody has to get. All the teachings are founded on this understanding that God has already done something for you. We're not trying to get God to do something. It's not like we're we're thinking if we bombard heaven with our prayers, then maybe God will put my prayer request on the top of the pile of prayer requests. No. We approach God by faith knowing that which we ask we have already received. So, Father, right now I thank you I thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for your love, your power. I thank you for touching people across this audience because of what you have already provided. So we receive it now, whatever it is. You can name it. You can say, Jesus, I'm receiving from you wisdom, healing, new life, joy, whatever it is, because it's already been given. You're not asking or begging to get something that maybe is not for you really. You're asking for something that God has already provided. Let us know what God has done for you. Would you call the Grace Prayer Center? And then I say a big thank you. I showed you that moving clip from one of our campaigns earlier. Uh, Thank you for standing with us and taking this gospel to the world. Whether you become a VIP partner or give your best right now, thank you. You're loved. Thank you. Your participation makes this global gospel ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the gospel to those who have never heard it, call 416-745-1820. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at P.O. Box 62039, RPO, Victoria Terrace, North York, Ontario, M4A 2W1 or P.O. Box 433, Winchester, Kentucky, 40392-9800. Together, let's give everyone a chance to know God's love in Jesus Christ.